morning, everybody. How's everybody this morning? Good. On behalf of the entire InfoCast team and the city of Denver, here on uh, our team on site and in corporate offices, we want to welcome you to the Denver Marijuana Management Symposium. My name's Gretchen Lusinger. I'm the president of InfoCast. Um, we're so excited to have you here and be partnering with the city of Denver for their fourth annual Denver Marijuana Management Symposium and our first year as a partner. And I would like to take a moment to thank um, the city of Denver, Bia and Ashley and Molly and everyone involved for giving us this opportunity um, to put on what will hopefully be a great conference for everyone. Um, I would also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, supporting organizations, and media partners for their support. Also like to thank all of our speakers and advisors for their input and participation in developing the content for this meeting. And of course, all of you, the attendees, for making it possible for us to bring this conference to you. Before we begin, please allow me to announce a few housekeeping notes. Please wear your name badge throughout the entire conference. Your name badge grants you access to all the event sessions and hospitality functions. If you haven't signed in yet, please do so either at the attendee desk or the speaker desk and get your badge. Um, please visit our sponsors at their exhibiting tables located right outside of this room. Today's luncheon will be from 12.15 to 1.45 in the lobby over there. Um, the Crestone foyer, there will be seating in the Crestone ballroom and then here, there will be a buffet. So just kind of, there are three different areas to come and eat your lunch. After lunch, we'll start the concurrent breakout sessions. Please look at the back of your name badge to see which room each session will take place in. Half will be here, the other half will be downstairs in the second floor in the Cripple Creek ballroom. We will be doing an Amazon Echo Dot drawing after the last session today. Please fill out this drawing card. You must fill out a comment to be eligible for the drawing and you must be present to win. So they should be all in your areas. If you could fill them out, it, it really helps us too with the comments. Um, compliments are of course always nice, but suggestions for improvement for how we can make this a better conference next year um, are also welcomed. Um, also included as part of the materials, sorry, you received at registration is this pink fold, this pink slip. It shows you where the um, presentations will be available for download. Um, so every presentation that we receive, we'll put on the web on, there. Um, join us for the networking reception this evening from 5 to 6.30, right out there. We'll have a cocktail networking reception. If you're a lawyer and you would like CLE credits, please see the registration table for the form um, for you to fill out to um, get your CLE. And then uh, the law enforcement roundtable will take place tonight from 7 to 9 at the Crime Lab Auditorium. This is a private event for law enforcement only, and a separate registration was required. There won't be any walk-in registration. So if you've registered, um, that will be tonight at the Crime Lab Auditorium. Sky has um, the street address, too. She can give it to you out there. So we are very pleased that Greg Felix and Judy Steele from Acela will be chairing this conference. Greg Felix is the Vice President of Strategic Solutions at Acela. In this position, he is responsible for promoting the Acela Civic Application for Cannabis to government agencies across the U.S., regulating the emerging legal and often complicated cannabis industry. Judy Steele is the Director of Cannabis Regulation for Acela's Center of Expertise a team of industry leaders with expertise in emerging and complex markets. In this role, she serves as a marijuana regulation and technology expert, helping government leaders navigate complicated licensing and permitting challenges and preparing communities for what's next. Um, I would like to next introduce and turn the meeting over to Ashley Kilroy, who's the executive director of the Denver Department of Excise and Licenses. Um, a brief bio on, on Ashley. After nearly three years as the Executive Director of Marijuana Policy in Denver, she was promoted in October 2016 by Mayor Michael B. Hancock to lead the city's Department of Excise and Licenses. Excise and Licenses is the central business licensing department for the city and county of Denver and includes the Office of Marijuana Policy. The department manages licensing for a broad range of businesses, including liquor stores, bars, restaurants, marijuana stores, and cultivation. In this position, Ms. Kilroy maintains responsibility for the administration and implementation of marijuana policy for Denver. 
She coordinates the marijuana-related work of various city departments, commissions, boards, offices, agencies and employees, and serves as Denver's liaison to local, state, and federal elected officials, agencies, and other partners on marijuana issues. Um, so please join me welcoming Ashley Kilroy. And again, thank you for attending the Denver Marijuana Management Symposium. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Denver, and it's great to see so many people here. I um, got here about 15 minutes early, and it's wonderful running into old friends, people that we've, we've worked with over the years, and then to see a lot of new faces. Um, and thank you, InfoCast. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Bia. Thanks to everybody who's really kind of put together the logistics to make this happen. So I think um, I was just talking to one of, our, one of our regulars from every four years about this symposium and why we do it. And we do it so we can all learn. We are in an area with marijuana regulation where it's brand new, where we're having to build the regulatory frameworks from the ground up. And even though we just met last year, it seems like things are, are moving so quickly. There's always something more to learn. We cities are uniquely positioned to learn from one another, to share ideas, to hear what you guys are doing, for you to hear what, what we're doing, to take what's best practices and to implement and share it so that we can all become better um, city, cities and build better communities. Um, I think, you know, I guess the first year, Denver, we were the very first. So there was a lot that you had to learn from us. But very quickly, the rest of these other cities who are, who are on board and doing this too have also jumped in and doing things a little bit different than Denver. So it's great that we can learn from each other in that way. But I think even more importantly, what I'm starting to see is some of the newer cities, some of the people who are new here are looking at things differently, are coming up with creative ideas and things that we, quite frankly, are going to be learning from you. Um, you, you might not have to be worrying about how are you going to do sea to sail tracking or some of that stuff. So you're able to jump right into some more, um, I'd say more creative and some more complex policy issues that we're excited to learn from you. Being first was not easy. We didn't have a symposium to go to and we didn't really have anybody to call. But what we did have was a great leader and great vision. We were very lucky to have our mayor who, um, I guess even as this was all coming down, was, was thinking of a plan, was figuring out how this was gonna look and coming up with his vision. Um, because of his vision, he set the bar high for us. He showed us a path forward and we've been able to implement and, and, and are happy to look back and say, wow, the sky didn't fall. Because I think as all of you remember, way back then, there, there were a lot of unknown fears, but because of our mayor's vision, we did not realize those fears, and instead, we've been moving through this successfully and methodically. So it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our mayor, Mayor Michael B. Hancock, the 45th mayor of Denver. Thank you, Ashley. Good morning, everyone. It is a, a real honor to be here this morning. Let me uh, first uh, be the first, uh, or second or third, actually, to welcome you all to this symposium and to uh, say that in this room, not only are you our honored guests, but I'm excited that so many of our agencies from the city of Denver who have been a part of helping to roll out this regulatory and enforcement framework and education framework um, are in this room as well. And if I can just acknowledge our, not only Ashley Kilroy and her team, but the Denver Fire Department, Denver Police Department, our Denver Public Health and Environment, our Department of Public Health and Environment are here as well. Uh, probably our Children's Affairs folks are in the room. So if you would join me in thanking all of these folks who are very much a part of this framework and helping to make Denver uh, not only a leader, but uh, really a, a casework on how to do this new industry around the world. Please join me in thanking all those department leaders. As I was looking at the folks who are registered here today, uh, I, am also, I also took special note of the fact that uh, we have the, the Netherlands and Canada represented in this room. Uh, I don't know where you are in this room, but we want to welcome you to the United States of America and welcome you to Denver, Colorado as well. On January 1st, Colorado will observe its fifth anniversary of rolling out this um, legal recreational marijuana industry. 
And I truly believe that when, when we all look back on this era of innovation and invention, if you will, in terms of an industry that never been seen around the world, in terms of a, re a legalized industry, I think um, we'll all marvel at what has been done, uh, particularly emanating from here in Colorado and particularly right here in Denver, Colorado. This is truly what I consider an example of good government. I was, I gotta tell you, one of the first people, one of the main people in 2012, when uh, this campaign was going on, who stood up and said, this is not gonna work. We should not legalize recreational marijuana in our city. Uh, we certainly shouldn't recognize it or, or legalize it throughout the state of Colorado. So I was a part of that chorus. As I look back on it now, um, some of the fears we had was we didn't know how it was going to impact our children. We had no idea how the federal government was going to respond uh, to this new industry. Um, we had no idea what it would mean in terms of crime um, in our cities, how our neighborhoods would be impacted. This was really our pool, our bailiwick of fear um, that we have seen um, in terms of people being engaged in drugs. And when it passed, and it was a very clear mandate by the people of Colorado, and I believe it passed by 61% here in Denver, Colorado. As an elected official, that gets your attention very quickly. And the people were clear about the fact that this was an industry or a move that they wanted to make. And as I began to investigate and talk to people who I really respected and really debate with them why they would vote to legalize recreational marijuana, it became pretty clear to me that it wasn't so much about you know, really giving people the access to marijuana that really got to their attention. It was just that they realized that we have built industries and very expensive industries around marijuana convictions, devastating communities and families, and that we could do better if we regulate, if we enforce, if we tax this particular drug and bringing it to the public in a way that uh, wasn't as devastating to our communities. And so today, here we are, res having responded five years ago to the mandate of the people. We're still on the leading edge of this issue, and we remain committed to ensuring that the regulations address both uh, current and future, future issues going forward. Um, because we still are learning. We still don't know what we don't know. Um, and we are very open to that. And the more we remain open to that, the more we're able to appropriately respond to things that uh, emerge from this legalized uh, uh, industry in our community. And change continues around the issue at a very, very rapid pace. Uh, but the Clavit approach, the framework that, that Ashley and her team have helped to not only create but manage over the last five years has helped us to respond quickly and effectively to address the issues uh, as they arise. This collaborative model, bringing all of our agencies together to keeping them at the table, continue to manage marijuana, uh, it includes multiple teams, the industry and our neighborhoods working together to preserve, protect, and enhance Denver's excellent quality of life. This work is grounded in the city's priorities of marijuana management, including robust regulation, uh, strict enforcement, and effective education. Now, after five years, I couldn't be prouder of the way our city has uh, gone about doing this work. We've been smart, we've been thoughtful, and we've come up with a model that the entire world is looking at, and one in which we continue, as I mentioned earlier, work to improve. In fact, uh, over the past few months, Ashley and, and I have hosted many of cities and states who have come to our city looking at our model and how they can implement their model. And as we see California and we see Washington State, we see Washington, D.C., all of these areas implement. We see very similar elements that have come out of Denver in terms of how we have implemented the legal framework. A lot of this is due, again, to the exceptional work and leadership of Ashley Kilroy. And I love to tell the story where I brought her into my office and she was a deputy director of our public safety department. Uh, which is not an easy job by any stretch of the imagination. And I said, I have one of the best opportunities you'll ever encounter in your entire life. And she looked at me and she said, what could that possibly be? I said, this is going to transform you like nothing else. 
I want you to be our director of marijuana policy. And she looked at me like I had a unicorn coming out of my head. <laughs> what in the world? I think I said marijuana czar. And she was like, what in the world does that mean? Well, we walked out of that meeting and Ashley was armed with a vision. We are going to make sure we build a rock solid regulatory framework around implementing this new industry. We need to give our enforcement teams the tools in which to enforce the laws that we build around this industry. We need to have a strong partnership with the industry and their players. They need to be at the table. They need to help build this because I believe what they build, they will support. And we need to do everything we can to protect our neighborhoods and our children. We need to make sure we educate because if we're going to have tax revenue come from this, part of that tax revenue is going to go to a strong educational model for our children and their families. Now let's go to work. I got to tell you, as a mayor of this city, I'm not a member of city council. I have made three, in the eight years, three visits to council committees. This was the very first one. And it was about sending a clear message to city council that as you develop the regulatory framework, we need to make sure that we protect our neighborhoods, we protect our children, and we do this responsibly for not only for the people of Denver, but also for those who are in the industry. I got to tell you, that has made all the difference. And so today, five years later, approximately $584 million in medical and retail sales in Denver in 2017 alone. Denver accounts for 39% of all Colorado sales. After setting up this regulatory scheme, the first few years, we're now able to deploy resources to address some of the most pressing issues of our city. Those tax revenues, which were $41 million last year, for forecasts for $48 million this year. We have used marijuana re revenue to fix our roads, to maintain our parks, and just this year, in partnership with an industry that we helped set up a regulatory framework with, we agreed to raise the tax rate on marijuana to help double our commitment to affordable housing in Denver from $150 million to $300 million. Through this, we still have uncertainty at the federal level. When legalized marijuana was beginning to spread, particularly starting in Colorado and Washington State, the Obama administration's approach um, was to wait and see and see how responsibly you implement this framework. But the current administration continues to send us mixed messages. That is why back in June, I brought together several mayors from around the country to form first of its kind government-led coalition to establish a national framework to proactively prepare governments for implementation of legalized marijuana. With 46 states having some form of legalization, the reality is legal marijuana is coming to a city near you. As mayors of cities that have successfully implemented and managed this new industry, we have hands-on experience that can help Congress take the right steps to support other local governments as they prepare to enter this new frontier and to do it responsibly. Steps like criminal justice reform and making necessary and needed changes to our banking system. And we will face common challenges when it comes to, we all face common challenges when it comes to legalizing marijuana. And those challenges need federal solutions so, so that implementation can be done smoothly, safely, and effectively. And in January, at the next full U.S. Conference of Mayors, it is my hope that our coalition will be ready to submit our federal policy recommendations so that we can start advocating for them at Congress. Our goal over the next few days is to be able to share what we have learned over the past five years and be collaborative with how we can all move forward in this with legalized marijuana. And that's the best way we can move forward in working together, learning from one another, and continuing to stay in a posture of being ready to learn as well. 
This is a phenomenal opportunity that's sweeping our nation, one in which I think will transform um, our criminal justice system, but more importantly, I think, do something very responsibly when it comes to this uh, industry. And for those of you who have not been able to implement it, we welcome you to ask questions, to dig in. I looked at the lineup of panels. What a great opportunity that I'm sure Ashley and all of us wish we had. Uh, but you have it now, so use it and learn from it. And we welcome your interjections. We welcome your, uh, your our ideas on how we can even get better. Uh, but more importantly, welcome to Denver, Colorado, and welcome to the next frontier. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, you know, in addition to what we're gonna learn today in these classes, I think it's really important just making those contacts today, getting to know your neighbors, um, and particularly attending the, the cocktail party, which is one of my favorite parts. Um, but I do know, just, just to tell you, just this month alone, I've spoken directly with my counterpart in Massachusetts. I spoke directly with my counterpart in um, Seattle. We had a multi-call with about five people from Seattle and five from Denver. B has talked to people in Oakland and New York and DC. So you'll meet people at this conference that will be people that you can connect with and call. I know our fire department has their counterparts in other fire departments across the country. So anyway, well, we're excited about the conference. We hope you, you enjoy it. We hope you learn a lot. And with that, I'm going to introduce um, our sponsor, um, Acela. Greg Felix is the Vice President of Strate Strategic Solutions um, for Acela. In Denver, we really do embrace that collaborative approach, whether it's in managing marijuana to dealing with our, well, even bringing the marijuana industry in as we're developing our regulations. But we really appreciate the hand-in-hand -hand and collaborative relationship that we have with Acela. Acela has built our licensing and permitting platform for marijuana. Um, the first in the world, and it's a great tool for us, and, and we continue to learn from Acela. So uh, here is Greg Felix. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ashley, for that great introduction. It was Ashley, and there you go. Excellent, thank you. Well, it's an honor to be here. Obviously, um, this is a unique symposium. As I was flying in, I was thinking, could we have imagined eight years ago that we'd be having a gathering of this size to talk about cannabis legalization to the level that we are? I think that really speaks volumes for the changes that are going on in society and also in our communities. And with change, there's always the need, especially with cannabis, to have oversight for all the reasons Mayor Hancock had, had cited, and for the reasons also that Ashley had mentioned. So today, uh, we have an opportunity to share with each other insights, lessons learned, best practices, and uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of issue a challenge to all of us. Reach out to somebody you've not yet met. Um, interact with them, ask them what they're doing, how they're approaching it, because this is really all about learning. It's about sharing with one another, some of the hard lessons and some of the things that we know work as it relates to cannabis regulation. Our role as a company is to support this effort. We think it's a noble effort. We think it's the right thing to do. And how many times, if you think about it in, in history, uh, do we have an opportunity to take a market that's really been operating in the shadows and bring it into a legal framework? It's the right thing to do for all, again, the reasons that uh, Mayor Hancock had pointed out. So uh, as a company, we are dedicated to you to providing the solutions that will support those efforts. Uh, we recognize the hard work and all of the, the really intense complexity that goes along with this, and it's our job to make sure that we provide you with the tools that support your efforts. And I think with that, what I'd now like to do is turn it over and introduce Mike Hartman, who is uh, Executive Director for Colorado's State, uh, Colorado's Department of Revenue. Mike?
Thank you very much and good morning. And I'd, uh, this time I'd like to ask Eric and Dave to both come up as well. Um, as Greg mentioned, my name is Michael Hartman. I am the Executive Director for the Colorado Department of Revenue. Um, in that responsibility, I, I have responsibility for four businesses in the state. I've got the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Tax Division, the Colorado Lottery, as well as our Enforcement Business Group. The Enforcement Business Group um, serves as the regulatory and enforcement arm for five different industries, marijuana being one of them. Um, so just to give you a sense as kind of how the state approaches things and, and what the economic contribution of marijuana is towards the state, the Department of Revenue is responsible for the collection of about $12 billion of the state's $30 billion annual revenue. Uh, marijuana in 2017 accounted for $247 million of that. So it's a little bit less than 1% of the state's overall revenue. Uh, we have 1,500 employees across the Department of Revenue. Uh, Marijuana Enforcement Division has about 120 employees. Excuse me. Uh, but given the fact that it's a little bit less than 10% of our workforce and it's less than 1% of uh, our overall revenues for the state, I was a little bit surprised when I took over this job 16 months ago to learn that it would take up about 40 to 60% of my time on an average basis. Uh, this industry is a fascinating one. It's one that continues to develop on a constant basis. And it's one where we have conversations every single day about what's the best way for us to approach this industry. Um, it, it, made me very happy to hear Ashley's remarks and the mayor's remarks as well because I think they align very much so with how we view things at the state. We think one of the hallmarks of Colorado's success is our desire to have every single voice represented out around the table when we're having discussions around regulations, when we're having discussions around market development, and it's important that we engage in discussions with communities like these to make sure that we're getting it right. Um, I don't know that you find that everywhere, but it's important to us that we hear from industry, what are the things that we're doing right from a regulatory perspective? What are the things that we're doing wrong from a regulatory perspective? And so we look to engage with partners here in the local community and the state community, but also now moving forward with the international community. Uh, five years ago, when we all undertook this experiment, it, it, Denver and Colorado really were the leaders in terms of stepping out there and trying to figure out how to do this. And since that time, I think that we've been passed to a certain degree with Canada now having done it at a national level and, and seeing the way that it's integrated. And, and the Netherlands certainly has had their experience for the past 40 years. And we're lucky today to start with more of a global perspective, to hear how other countries are doing it and handling it um, so that we can learn from their perspectives and go from there. So with that, I'm going to sit at the table along with Eric and Dave, and um, I'm going to ask them to kind of give us a brief introduction as to who they are, what their backgrounds are, um, and then also kind of to lay the groundwork so everybody's set at the same position starting the conversation exactly where their regulatory environments are as a country. Um, and then after about five or ten minutes of that discussion, we'll go back and forth with some conversation. And I want to leave 10 or 15 minutes at the end to allow everybody else to ask questions because candidly, as much as we like to sit up here and pontificate, uh, frankly, most of the best learning happens when you ask us questions and we can inform you of our view and we can learn of the things that are important to you in that aspect. So with that, Dave, do you mind kind of starting us off? Yes, thank you very much. I had a presentation ready. A short one with only pictures, but I don't see it. <laughs> okay. So, but let me start first by thanking you uh, at this Congress that we, as the Netherlands, can also be here. And although we have had policy for over the last 40 years, we still need to learn a lot. And uh, no, that's the wrong one. That's Canada. Different country. <laughs> I can tell you something about myself. Let's start out that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this will be annoying. Um, so I studied criminology and law, and uh, for eight years ago I started working for the Dutch government. I first started at a whole different ministry, and now for the last three years I've been a legal policy advisor on alcohol and drug legislation in the Netherlands. Um, that was my main job, and alcohol was my main uh, business because uh, the drug policy was kind of like the same for over the last 40 years. And then we had elections, and uh, at the last elections in 2017, things changed. And uh, they changed a lot because the coalition with four parties in it, they agreed upon a sentence, and I can show you the sentence if you find my presentation, otherwise I will just tell you, um, to conduct an experiment to see if we could close the supply chain 
of cannabis. Uh, and that was, yeah, something for us. And, and uh, I will tell you briefly about it. I can imagine there are a lot of questions. You can ask me. I brought two colleagues with me. Uh, they're from uh, the Department of Justice. So law enforcement questions, they can answer it all. Uh, I'm the, from the Ministry of Health, so that's more my side. And the whole experiment is a cooperation between our two ministries. But to understand what's going to happen in the Netherlands, I shortly need to tell you a little bit about the current drug policy in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we have made a distinction between soft and hard drugs. Soft drugs, cannabis, mushrooms, and, and maybe some medicines. Hard drugs, ecstasy, cocaine, heroin, all the rest. Mostly of our drugs are hard drugs. And for the last 40 years, we have, we have had a special soft drugs policy the so-called uh, policy of tolerance. And the, this policy is that we have coffee shops, and in the coffee shops, if they apply to the rules, it is tolerated that they sell cannabis to consumers. The growing, the trafficking, and the selling not in a coffee shop is not tolerated in the Netherlands and is illegal. So this resulted in a front door where you can, as a consumer, go into the coffee shop and buy cannabis and in an illegal back door. We don't know where the cannabis comes from to the Dutch coffee shops. Um, I had a picture of the Netherlands now for you. The Netherlands is small. We fit into Colorado six and a half times. Um, and in the Netherlands, we have uh, 473 coffee shops in 103 cities. And in total, we have over 300 cities. So there are a lot of cities in the Netherlands where you cannot buy cannabis. And if you would look at the map, you will see that our biggest cities have a lot of coffee shops. So if you look at the map of the Netherlands, most of the coffee shops are concentrated in Amsterdam. You all know Amsterdam. And then some other cities. Uh, but it is very concentrated. But the coffee shops had brought a lot of problems with it for the local municipalities on problems on health-related issues, problems on... Uh, crime, undermining crime, I mean criminals make a lot of money from uh, growing cannabis and then sending it legal to the coffee shops. So there was a call for the government to do something about that. And what can we do? So we agreed upon an experiment. And the experiment is going to be a controlled cannabis supply chain in six to ten large and medium-sized cities. And the aim of the whole experiment is to see if it is possible to close the supply chain, and what will happen. So what we want to see, we want to see what will be the effects of closing the supply chain on crime, public safety, public nuisance, and public health. Within the experiment, we're going to make it possible that in these six to ten municipalities, the Opium Act will not be in place. So, in these six to ten cities, and for the growers in the experiment, it will be legal to grow, uh, traffic, and sell cannabis. For the rest of the Netherlands, the situation will stay the same as it is right now with the coffee shops. So nothing will change to that. What we're going to do then is just going to measure everything. What will happen? What will, what, what will be the effects? Will people go to the legal coffee shops? Will they go to the illegal coffee shops? What do consumers think? Will there be a lot of cannabis going from the Netherlands to Germany, Belgium, or any other countries. We're going to measure all of that. And to make it a good scientific experiment, we also had a, uh, installed an independent advisory committee with experts from all kinds of fields, from law, from health, from... And they, they did a lot of talking in four months. They came up with a report. The report is now only in Dutch, but we are translating it right now. So it will be available in English if you want to know what they... Uh, have brought up. They have looked at everything, like do we need labeling uh, with age, with pregnancy, what must be on the label, how do we do it, um, how much supply can a coffee shop have, how, how much supply can a grower have. So all these kind of practical questions, and that's the thing we all want to learn from Denver, of course. The step, next step as a government is we drafted a bill to make the experiment possible. This bill is in Parliament right now. So I don't know what will happen, but the bill is on a higher level. The ah, the presentation. <laughs> oh. Now you can see the Netherlands. Um, 
Can you help me? Because there's. I don't know how to make it bigger. But you can see here, this is the Netherlands. <laughs> and if you look at the black cities, those are the cities with more than 10 uh, coffee shops. Um, well, this is the text I just told you. The two guys are our ministers. Uh, they are the ones who make, have to make this all possible and defend it in parliament and make all the, politic, uh, the uh, political decisions. Um, I already told you, there's an independent advisory committee they drafted a big report, so it's now only in Dutch, but it will be in English. And I was saying we were very busy drafting a bill. The bill is on a higher level. The, the bill only makes clear the purpose and duration of the experiment, but all the practical rules are in an uh, accompanying order. And that's our work right now. We are trying to fill that order with all details in what the experiment, uh, what the experiment must look like. Um, I think, because I'm almost running out of time, what very, what's very in, uh, important to say is we are very worried about uh, international law. Uh, we know international law and experiment or legalizing is a, different, it's a difficult question. So we decided we wanted to have a small experiment. That's why only six to ten municipalities. And it will last for four years. And then we will review all the effects, we will have a scientific evaluation and we will see what we will do after. But it is not a point of no return. It's not sure that the Netherlands will go to legalization. We're just going to do the experiment, see what happens. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Costin uh, from Canada, which is not a small country. It's a really big country. Um, and we don't like to call what we're doing an experiment. Um, so uh, who, who am I, I guess, organizationally, just to give you a, a bit of a sense. Um, my, my title has changed a few times over the years. But basically, uh, I'm the guy who had the privilege and the responsibility to lead the federal team uh, across a bunch of different departments, uh, namely the Department of Health, Department of Justice, and our Department of Public Safety, which is probably a little bit like your Department of Homeland Security at the federal level, uh, to effectively design a national framework for legalizing and regulating cannabis. We call it cannabis. We used to call it marijuana, but we call it cannabis now. Uh, we used to call it marijuana, we spelled it with an H. Uh, I could tell you about that some other time. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of what motivates, what motivated the government's decision is it actually very consistent with what you heard the mayor describe. Um, the reality in Canada for the last 20 years, 30, 40 years, you can go back and look at the data for as long as you want, and there have been uh, extraordinary high rates of use, uh, and that's, that's notwithstanding some fairly intensive law enforcement activities. So the laws that we had on the books were quite severe, 25 to life for possession, 50% of all drug offenses were cannabis related. So notwithstanding some fairly severe enforcement efforts, you still had uh, uh, one in three uh, adults the age 20 to 24 who would report using cannabis. Uh, over 50% of all Canadians report using it at one point in their life. And of course, not surprisingly, there was a multi-billion dollar industry that kind of emerged right before our eyes. So the calculus is, there's a lot better, there's a better way, there's a better control framework for managing the risks associated with that situation. So two weeks ago, uh, a new federal law was passed. 
uh, and a cascading series of federal regulations that effectively would give rise to uh, a new national program, uh, a regulated, a very, very strictly regulated uh, industry. So the supply chain from uh, the, the, the from, from literally from the seed uh, through to uh, the, the sale and, and, and consumption. Now, uh, we'll talk a lot about this, and, and Mike, I won't, I'm not going to go on for very long, because uh, well, we'll, we'll talk a lot about this, and I'll give you guys, you guys hopefully get a bit of an insight about what it is we're up to. But I wanted to say that, um, again, kind of echoing the mayor's comments and, and wanting to express thanks and gratitude to not only Mike, you, your predecessor, Ashley, uh, the whole team, not only in Denver, but at the state level, uh, in Washington and Oregon in particular. Um, but I have to say that over the last three years, which is about as long, about, it's about, that's about how long we've been on this road to develop the legalized framework. Uh, we've benefited tremendously from the relationship and the openness that our kind of US uh, friends ha have, have shown us. We've learned a, a tremendous amount and benefited great. And it's since that the family's gotten a little bigger uh, um, and, and, that's, and that's terrific. And so we're very happy uh, and very, very grateful to have been along for the ride. Um, I think I'm, think I'm going to leave it at there. There is a little, I know we're having some issues with technology, so I'm kind of tempting fate here. Um, we did have a little video to give you kind of the basics, but I, I have no idea what I'm doing right here. So <laughs> if, if, <laughs> go up. Uh, this isn't a touch screen though, right? Uh, you'd think I'm a millennial, but I'm really not. Oh, wait a second, there we are, okay. So, um, let's see, oh, geez, yeah, let's see, I'm, I told you. I'm actually 21 years old. <laughs> Seriously, why are you It laughing? is now legal for adults to use cannabis in Canada, but there are a few things you need to know. Cannabis became legal for adults on October 17th, 2018. It's your responsibility to know what is legal in your province or territory, including the legal age and where you are able to buy and use cannabis. If you're high, don't drive or go to work. Store cannabis securely and away from kids and don't travel internationally with cannabis. Whether you're leaving or entering Canada, it remains illegal to take cannabis across the Canadian border. Find out more and get the facts at canada.ca slash cannabis. A message from the Government of Canada. So it, this is obviously an exceedingly complex topic and communicating it has been something that I know other governments have struggled with. We have struggled with it. It's a, an emotionally charged issue. It's a polarizing issue. It's an issue that's infused, get it, infused, with myth and mythology on all sides of the spectrum. And so um, this, it's, this, this nugget um, really simply was a, a kind of way to introduce you to some basic things, but I'm happy to, happy to be here, happy to have the invitation to be here, Mike, and uh, excited to talk to folks uh, over the next uh, couple of days. Excellent. Are these, are these microphones on? Can you hear us? Yes. And I don't know if you guys need to turn yours on as well. But um, So one of the things we wanted to do as part of the conversation is to talk about some of the more challenging aspects we've seen across the state of Colorado, some of the policy decisions, um, some of the ones that are still acute that are out there that we're wrestling with, and get insights from these gentlemen on how their countries are experiencing those issues as well to maybe help inform our future policy discussions. Uh, from that perspective, let's start with social consumption. Um, you know, Dave, the Netherlands obviously for 40 years now has had the coffee shops and has allowed social consumption to exist. You appear to be evolving from that perspective now into having more of a regulated um, supply chain, if nothing else. What are your society's views on social consumption? How do you approach that um, from a health ministry perspective? Have you guys seen any concerning trends or any positive trends that you would comment on that front? And then Eric, when he's done, I'd love to hear how Canada is approaching that and what uh, data you guys are looking to to understand whether social consumption is a good part of your policy or a bad part of your policy. 
Uh, yes. Well, yes, of course, we have to have the coffee shops for 40 years. And most of our coffee shops, or a lot of our coffee shops, also have a consumption room where people use cannabis. Um, but I went on a tour yesterday here in Denver, and I learned there's a big difference between the using of cannabis in Denver and in the Netherlands. Um, you use it in all kinds of products. Uh, you make a lot of it. Uh, you, you bake a lot of things with it. In, in the Netherlands, people smoke cannabis uh, most of the time with tobacco. And that's our main concern uh, for now, because uh, smoking rules are getting tougher. We are kind of following the, the states. Uh, but in a coffee shop, it will still be allowed to smoke cannabis. But it's only allowed in the, in the coffee shop. If you are outside in the Netherlands and you have cannabis with you, it is still illegal. I think that's also a thing people forget. If you have cannabis on you and the police sees it, they will seize it. You won't get punished, you won't get a fine if you hand it over voluntarily, but it is still uh, an illegal thing. Thank you. Eric? Um, I mean, it's, it's funny, it's, it, like so many of these questions, we could probably spend the whole two hours talking about yes. that one thing, right? So, um, uh, uh, social consumption is sort of an interesting concept. So, if you were to come to Canada and listen to us talk about this, you'd hear us repeat the phrase over and over, public health approach, public health approach, public health approach. And, and what, what we mean by that is really we're looking at... Um, um, through a, a, a sort of a, a series of, of comprehensive actions to change behaviors that are the riskiest. So um, in this case, the way the government's defined it, leaving aside some of the market issues, you know, we want to create a regulated marketplace to displace the illegal marketplace. We want to decrease the burden on the justice system and then decrease the burden that the justice system places on the individuals who interact with it. But when it comes to consumption, I think we need to have a bit more of a textured conversation. So we know the evidence tells us the health risks are greatest uh, amongst certain population groups, certain age groups, and certain behaviors associated with that. So what I mean specifically is the younger, the younger in the initiation of the younger the age of the initiation of use, the greater the risk, the more often they use, uh, and, and, and the longer the duration of that use is. And so when we look at consumption and we look at um, kind of where we'd like to move the yardsticks, we'd very much like to use, move the yardsticks where the risks are greatest. So the way the government's articulated its goals, it wants to, through this framework, decrease access, decrease use amongst those for whom the risks are greatest and amongst those whom are using in a way that is problematic or most harmful. So occasional users who are in sort of the midpoint of their life, who are maybe consuming and non-smoked in, in a non-smoked form is, is a far less interest to us than a 17-year-old or a 21-year-old who uses on a daily basis. And, and so it, it, when we talk about consumption, we, we're trying to kind of break apart this kind of generalized nature of using as good or bad and really to try to get at the heart of the matter and target our interventions where we think they're going to have the greatest impact and maybe not worry so much about some other things where, the, frankly, the impact would be marginal at best. And like our Dutch friends, we are, we are like giddy with monitoring, evaluation, data collection, and measurement. And Mike, if you just let me, the, the two, the two kind of critical lessons that we, you know, I remember meeting Louis Koski for the first time and Andrew when we were here a couple of years ago, and they kind of basically grabbed me by the ears and said, like, Collect data, collect it early, and, and be ambitious in the cross-section of indicators you look at, and start educating as soon as you can. And we took both those lessons to heart. Excellent. Thank you. And I, I actually want to get to the data question really quickly, but uh, I want to follow up on a statement that you made in terms of trying to identify the populations where you want to decrease use um, from a risk perspective. In that regard, I think um, at least our governor has spoken about from a social consumption, meaning can we consume it in public places? Can we consume it in dedicated coffee shops, bars, those kinds of things? Those are steps we as a state have not yet taken. Um, as you're looking at the actual areas where people are allowed to consume cannabis, whether it's in a um, edible form, in a smoked form, vape, et cetera, are you identifying the locations where it can be consumed with the framework of trying to minimize exposure to those communities that you may not want to 
partake as heavily as others. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Although this is where, this is where it becomes fun, right? So I'm the federal government, right? Federal governments don't typically regulate local matters in the way that you're describing. So that what, when I say federal program or national program, what, what I really mean is you've got a national piece of legislation that kind of broadly defines the laws, and then within that, we have provincial and territorial, are equivalent to your state laws, where there's a tremendous amount of room to apply laws pursuant to the authorities of those particular governments, and then beyond that, municipal governments. So questions of place of use, consumption, like, so I think each province and each municipality has taken on board the responsibility of answering those questions, and frankly, each have taken slightly different. As a general rule, what, what we've seen in the, in the early days is basically people have taken whatever laws are in place for tobacco consumption and simply extended those to cannabis. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. So let's shift to data because you're right. Uh, the one thing that we say at the state level whenever other jurisdictions come to us is figure out the data you want to collect, establish baselines before you legalize, and then monitor, monitor, monitor. And unfortunately, Colorado did not do that. It's one of the lessons we learned, um, having been one of the fo uh, foremost legalization locations in the world. What are, and Dave, let's start with you, what are the data points, the most significant data points that you're looking at as a country from a health perspective, from a public safety perspective, et cetera, um, that you kind of are, are trying to test whether the experiment is going to be successful or not? And then as a follow-on to that, who ultimately gets to make the decision, yes, it has been successful, or no, it has not been successful? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, and I was trying to come back. I wanted to come back to your first question. In the Netherlands, we also have uh, national rules um, for specific groups. So a coffee shop cannot be, cannot be too close to a school. Officially, you cannot go in there if you're not Dutch. Um, so we have some certain rules, but also, just like in Canada, it's the municipalities who make the rules. Okay. So they go for it. But for the data, yeah, we, we collect a lot. We know, uh, we try to collect a lot of uh, using data. So how much do people use, uh, when do they use, and then compared to age, and, but for now they buy it on the illegal market. Um, so in the experiment we want to see what happens. Do people go to the legal coffee shops? Are they first timers? Are they regular users? Do the regular users go to illegal coffee shops? Uh, do, they, uh, what do, they do they like our cannabis or don't, don't they like the controlled cannabis? Uh, what happened with hashies? Uh, so, and from a justice point of view, we look at uh, what happens in the neighborhood. Uh, and an important thing, of course, is that, that we're doing this, uh, this experiment came up from municipalities who had problems with undermining crime and all sort of things. So do mayors like the experiment, the 10 mayors who are involved in the experiment, or six to 10, what do, what do they think about the experiment? That will be collected all over the place, but we have still, we now have experts thinking about what can be measured? Because from a health perspective, it's very hard to measure if the legal cannabis has an effect on health. That will be something we have to measure in a long time of, of period. And your last question, who makes the decision if it's successful? Politics. Yep. We're gonna give the results. We're gonna tell them what happened. That will be not me, but an independent group of scientists and then it's up to Parliament. So it, you do anticipate, though, that it will be a parliamentary decision, not a vote of the people in any way, shape, or form? No, but a vote of the people, we, we don't really have a vote of the people. Okay. You, you, you vote for Parliament, but we don't have, and, and we even, no, we don't have referenda anymore. So there, there will be no, the vote of the people will be that they chose Parliament, mm -hmm. and we will choose again in three years. Perfect. That's thank, it. Thank you. And Eric, let's talk about your data. Yeah, sure. So, like I said, so it was an early, an early lesson that we we took to heart. Um, so, so frankly, um, there's probably a lot of different ways I could answer that. There's a bunch of different. There's a there's a bunch of national data collection instruments that we've deployed, uh, including uh, an inaugural uh, Canada Cannabis Use Survey. So, the, and it's been in the field twice now already. Um, we have a good partnership across a whole variety of sectors that would be collecting all the data that you would imagine we would be collecting and probably a lot of data you wouldn't imagine. 
So there's a whole series of, as has been suggested, I think fairly obvious health questions, and maybe less obvious health questions. I think we're, we want to make sure that we understand not only questions of cannabis use and prevalence rates, but how those use correlate to uses of other substances and other behaviors. The whole kind of panoply of health indicators from the, you know, the emergency room visits and poison control stuff and all of that, all, of, all that sector. But then there's a series of justice, economic, um, across a broad, sort of a broad array of, of sectors. We've got a fairly well-developed framework that sort of itemizes all these things. But I think the most exciting part of all this is we have, a, at, at the federal level, we have a national, kind of an institution um, called Statistics Canada, which is really the keeper of all kind of, of all, all data. Um, basically like a, they're, the, they're the ones that would do our national census and these sorts of things. Can you imagine there is actually something out of this institute, this federal, this federal agency that is called the Cannabis Stats Hub. And it's a, a, a place where we proactively push out all of this raw data that would not only allow governments, but then allow the research community, academics, the private sector to kind of look at it and to get to your question around who ultimately decides. I mean, I think it's a very specific question for what's happening in Holland, but I think for what's happening in Canada, I mean, his, the history books will ultimately be the final kind of um, sort of judge, judge and jury. But what we're doing is in an effort to tell the Canadian story in as transparent a way as we possibly can and to facilitate a good clear-eyed sense into what's happening and its broad-based impacts, all of this data is being made public through this, uh, this can cannabis statistics hub. And is that hub politicized in any way, shape, or form? Is there disagreement about the facts or are the facts the no. facts? So that's, so, um, I mean, without getting too far into the weeds, um, the, uh, Th this institute is, by its creation, uh, uh, not, not, it's apolitical. Um, and so it, it, it exists free from the prevailing winds of politics. Uh, and I think because of that, um, the data will have a, a tremendous amount of integrity. Um, yeah. Great. So one of the things that I think Colorado recognized pretty quickly was um, through the extensive home grow laws that we allowed for the medical community in particular, it allowed for a black market to uh, develop, not necessarily for consumption and sales here in the state, but for actually development of the product and likely diversion of the product into other jurisdictions, which we view as one of the absolute hallmarks of our regulatory infrastructure is we cannot allow that to happen. However, we still, um, even after having put in laws that limit legal grows in homes to 12 plants, regardless of the number of people that live in the home, we still do see some black market activity. And it's probably one of the bigger problems that we are trying to tackle at this point in time and we are putting more resources towards. Um, I personally think that it is an unintended consequence that arises from the fact that we have pockets of illegality around us still. And I am wondering, what is your expectation of black market activities in your countries, given that you will have federal level policies at this point in time? I know it's probably a little too early to say what your actual experience has been, but what do you guys anticipate in terms of actual black market activity? Oh, yes. Let, let me first start. In the Netherlands, you can have five, you cannot have any plans, but if you have up to five plants, you will not get uh, prosecuted. And our medical cannabis, it's, it's completely different than the medical cannabis I've, I've seen uh, yesterday. Medical cannabis is really grown in a, in, a, in, a, in a place where they have standards like any other pharmaceutical business. So you wouldn't be able to go in there to touch the plants. It's completely controlled. And the medical cannabis in the lens is always the same, like aspirin or any other medicine. So. For medicines, you go to a doctor and you get it at a, at a specific pharmacy. Uh, but the black market in the Netherlands is big and it will stay big. I know the uh, Ministry of Justice had a, a, a study about how much of the Dutch cannabis is going to other countries. Um, on average, I would say 80% of the cannabis which is grown now will go to other European countries. And I think the experiment will not influence that. As I said, we will have six to 10 municipalities joining this experiment. That's a small group. So there will be 
many other coffee shops who need cannabis, and there will be many other European countries who want cannabis. So the, the black market will stay there. Maybe, like you said, if all countries in the world legalize cannabis, So it would be hard to, to identify the single most contentious issue that uh, the debate in, in Canada, you know, kind of, you know, the, the single most contentious in, within that debate. But if I had to pick something, it would probably be this one. It would probably be home grow. Um, uh, like Colorado and in other states in the U.S., you know, in Canada, we have a long legacy of a medical cannabis program that started off as entirely a home grow regime that kind of went, uh, kind of, kind of grew to a proportion and, and in a manner that became completely unsustainable and really became the backbone of the illegal marketplace that emerged over time in, in Canada. So there's a there's a there's a like a sort of a legacy that really in, you know really kind of shaped the debate. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the decision was to enable a little bit like you have here. For, we, we have a four plant uh, allowance per residence. Um, the more difficult question about where, you know, how the black market will respond is, 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 has been a kind of central part of our design. Um, and, and I think one of the benefits of having a federal program and working in cooperation with you know, in, you know, basically our state level governments is that there was a, a, an ability to cooperate across the entire country in order to create uh, a regulated marketplace that will be competitive. And, and recognizing that really this is, to a certain extent, at least in terms of a domestic, a domestic black market, it's really a market solution here. So we're gonna wanna create a marketplace where the consumer chooses to go, where the product is of, of sort of equal or a greater quality, where the price is competitive, and that's where we, ne we, you know, we negotiated across Canada a coordinated taxation program where all governments signed on to the principle to not overtax to make sure that the prices were competitive so that they could capture consumers quickly, at least at the onset. And then over time, we have the flexibility to raise taxation levels to kind of to basically achieve the public health goals that we want to achieve. But at least at the outset, we can be modest in our uh, revenue generation activities, um, and, and really have a very vigilant oversight and a commitment to enforce anybody who decides to play outside of the rules. And I would say that by having a cooperative system where you have every jurisdiction in the country fully subscribed to the endeavor, it creates an incentive, an enforcement incentive that perhaps hasn't, hasn't existed in the, much the same way over the last couple of years. So. It's hard not to sound a little bit naive, um, but, I, I mean, but, but I think what we're seeing is a, a tremendous potential for a regulated marketplace to significantly displace over time the domestic, the domestic black market. And frankly, we, do, we needn't look any further than the experience with the end of alcohol prohibition. And that it took years, it took a couple of decades, frankly, for the entire kind of illicit industry to vanish, but it did. And I think that's a pretty progressive view, at least for the, the United States. I would argue that if you look across our population, while you look at the statistics, it's probably increased to, call it 66% of the, the American populace is in favor of legalization in some form or function. I would argue it's probably more 50-50 as to whether we really should look at the elimination of prohibition of alcohol to be different. Is that kind of your personal opinion, or is that pretty, a pretty pervasive opinion in Canada? Well, so, it, the, so the, it's funny. That, so the Canadian experience and how the law came about was very different than the U.S. experience, a little bit more like the kind of the Dutch piece. So this was, this was a policy that during the last federal election, the, the Liberal Party advanced, and then once they were elected and it was part of their mandate, we were then given the marching orders to do what we needed to do to put the law together. Um, so, as a public servant, you know, we don't typically spend a whole lot of time paying attention to, to polls. Like, like the, the, the government was elected, it was their mandate, and it was my job to, to execute it. I mean, observing the, and being kind of in the, in the middle of the public debate, it's interesting, right? Like, it's, it's, a, it's, a ver it's very emotional. I've said that a couple of times. It, it's cultural. Um, it's regional. It's sectoral. Um, I think... The, the polling questions are flawed because the polling questions 
tend to ask these kind of academic theoretical questions. Do you think someone should go for, to jail for you know, having, you know, having marijuana, having cannabis? It's very easy for people to say no and then they extrapolate support from those types of questions. It's very different when they're faced with the possibility that there's gonna be a store opening at the end of their street. And so there's always been broad support across Canada for um, a change in, in the cannabis laws. But that's not to say that there, it hasn't been, you know, at the community level or even regionally, um, um, so very, very kind of strong opinions, both in, for, for, uh, for and, and against. And so I think it's very, very difficult to gauge generally. Um, um, but, 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 it, but at the end of the day, uh, the majority of the voters elected a government for whom this was a central pillar to their election platform, and, and that's kind of how we ended up where we are. Dave, what about you? Is, what's public sentiment in the Netherlands? I think we're very similar to Canada. I mean, if you look at a map of the Netherlands, you see that there are 200 cities that don't have any coffee shops. So I think in general, you can say that the Dutch don't have a negative attitude against uh, cannabis, um, especially I can say this now, the millennium generation we are both part of. Um, we grew up in a country where there's, there's cannabis. And if you want to smoke cannabis, you go to the coffee shop. No big deal. If you want to have a beer, you go to a bar. No big deal. So it's nothing special for us anymore. But I don't know. That's not the general opinion in the whole of the Netherlands. Um, no, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Thank you. Um, I know that we're starting to run a little bit short on time, and I want to make sure that we do leave time for questions from the audience. I'm going to ask one more question to the panel, and then um, in the process, if those who have questions can line up at the microphones, that would be great. We'll then transition to you guys. Uh, so in the state of Colorado, I'm responsible for, along with the team that informs all of the policy decisions and discussions, signing off on the final rules um, that regulate the industry for the state. And I think from that perspective, it's important that we all have a lens through which to view that conversation as we're all coming to the table to discuss um, the rules and the regulations. The lens that I've provided my team with and the way that I think about the, the overall industry is we have the coal memo that was in place until recently at the federal level and it identified eight things that we had to comply with in order to keep our federal government um, at least uh, a little bit at bay in terms of what our programs are. I really think those eight or nine things boiled down to three things. So we describe it as having an overarching policy of public health and safety that's always going to be our default and we talk about that every single chance we get public health and safety. But other, underneath that, the three prongs are, number one, keep it out of the hands of youth, number two, keep it out of the hands of criminals, and number three, keep it out of other jurisdictions. What would you communicate as kind of your guiding lens through which you guys look at putting the regulations in place within your countries, or is that mandated by some other government? Well, honestly, it would be very similar to what you just enumerated, right? Like, so the federal legislation actually in, it, in, in the opening pages articulate what the kind of the goals are. And in many ways you just articulated them. So I think that the driving, the driving, the driving goal is uh, expressed in terms of public health and safety, decreasing youth access. It's about, uh, you know, the, the vernacular is get it out of the hands of criminals, but it's really about kind of displace the illegal market, replace it with a highly regulated one, which will also have, you know, protect consumers by having a quality controlled product. And then there's a sort of, sort of a series of, um, of, sort of sort of secondary uh, objectives that flow, flow from that. But I don't know that that broad frame is, is, is very, very different at, at all. Um, yeah. Great. Dave? No, I think, I think in the Netherlands it's, it's kind of the same. I think the difference is we have the, uh, the age at 18, you have the age at 21. Uh, but we want to protect people under 18. That's why coffee shops cannot be too close to schools. Uh, and we, of course, want to keep it out of the hands of criminals. That's why we want to do the experiment, because of all the undermining uh, criminals. And I spoke to a, a, a public defender uh, once, and, and she told me all criminal activities, all criminals are into cannabis. So I don't know if that's true, but that's, that's of course, a main focus for us. Okay. Any questions out there? I don't see anybody lined up at the uh, po at the microphone, so I'll, I'll keep going on my side then. Someone's, someone's coming oh, through the go light. Go for it, yes, please. 
Hi, I was waiting because uh, I'm from Denver, so I didn't want to. Uh, but anyways, I have a question for Eric and Dave. Uh, I think a main difference from both your countries to the U.S. is a very strong welfare state with a free health system, right? So how do you see legalization impacting the health system, and are you prepared to deal with that? I don't know if, if, if it will make an impact on our health state, on our health system. I mean, what I just said, we, we have this policy in place for, for over 40 years. Um, if you look at numbers, we have the lowest incidence in Europe and maybe even worldwide if we can compare it. Um, so from the Ministry of Health, um, we are doing quite fine. We will say at first, please don't use, but if you use, we will give you a lot of advice on how to use it. Um, and that's going fairly uh, good, especially with cannabis, if you look at incidents. So. Yeah, so my answer is not a whole lot different. It's, it's almost, but, but the, the premise of the question is kind of, it's kind of interesting. And it's, we get a lot of questions like this. And it's, it's the, the premise seems to suggest that by the change in law is either going to, is going to introduce a new problem in, into society that in this case, the, the health system will have to bear the brunt of. But I'm not sure that that's the right premise. It's certainly not the one that we've taken as a government, right? Like the idea is the problem as it's been in place for years and years and years is, is bad and is unsustainable. And, you know, what I said earlier, like one in five teenagers, one in three uh, between the ages of 20 and 24. So that, that's, where we, that's where we started off in October. So the, 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 the proposal is that we can do better than that with these new tools that we have in place. And so, yeah, there's, there's been a, a ton, of, ton of discussion with those in uh, our healthcare system. But again, the, the, the idea is to actually uh, decrease the, those numbers and, and decrease the harms, the health harms, to your question specifically. Um, so, whether, and, and, and so in, in some ways, all of the questions that we get around, you know, sort of as soon as your law comes into force, all of these new problems are going to emerge. We kind of push back on a little bit and say, well, actually, like what we're trying to do, these problems exist. They've existed for years and years and years and they haven't gone away. We had certain tools. Those tools didn't work. So now we've got a bunch of new tools and we think they're going to be a little better. We were able to push in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the 70s, the smoking rate in Canada was 50%. And through a series of public health interventions that are more or less identical to the ones that we've put in place through the Cannabis Act, we were able to get that down to 11%. And, and we're basically, I, our gamble is through the same type of policy interventions through you know, smart pricing, uh, policy interventions through things like place of use, ease of access, um, education, whether it's broad-based public education or whether it's actually directly um, communicating to consumers through things like the package and health warning messages or targeted point of sale uh, education campaigns and so on like there's a, I obviously can talk a lot right the, the through replicating those types of interventions will do a lot better than we have in the last 20 years by just kind of saying don't do drugs great thank you uh, hi there. Uh, thanks for coming, gentlemen. Um, my name is Murray Knowles. I'm with Ottawa City Police in uh, Canada. My question is for you specifically, David, and if you could go uh, into a little bit of um, <clears throat> specifics in regards to the independent advisory group, uh, maybe mandate um, what makes them independent, uh, and just a little bit about that, that'd be great. Thank you. What makes them independent? Well, we, um, we formed the commission, commission uh, by law, and we looked at a, at a chairman, we appointed him in an, in an, in an act, I think you, you would call it, um, and he got the specific assignment by both ministers, and both ministers said, I don't care what you find, you find it and publish it, and you form your commission. So we only appointed the chairman, the Heer Knot Neers is his name, and he found all the experts, he did all the talks, we weren't part of all the talks, um, we just, were there when they had a meeting as a listener. We had no voice. We had no. We could not influence the report on on any way. And he published it and he gave it to our minister. And there are things in there which are kind of difficult for us. But yeah, he is independent. So that's great. 
Over here. Good morning, uh, Tom Polk from Sarasota, Florida. Given the fact that this, this session is on regulating marijuana, I was going to ask, um, both your countries are involved with industrial hemp. And is there a distinction in your regulations tied to hemp, industrial hemp and CBD extracts versus the marijuana? Um, it's becoming big conversation here in the States, but I know you've, both countries have had a long history with, with that product for some time. Thank you. I, yes, that's different. We have a, a special rule in our Opium Act for, uh, I think the correct translation would be fiber, hennep, that's what we call it. Um, and it's uh, European, European ruled. So there are specific uh, rules. There are only, I think, five seeds you have to use. You have to grow it in the open air, full ground. Um, and it has only, it, it can only have like 0.2% of THC in it. But our fiber hennep, to call it this way, can only be used for two things, to collect the seeds or to make, uh, to, to use the strains in it. So uh, that's it. Yeah, we have two, um, two fairly independent frameworks. And so one that you know, provides the rules for, for the cultivation and sale of industrial hemp, hemp seeds and fiber and the rest of it. Um, and then another set of regulations that we spend most of our time talking about, which is really the ones that govern the industry that, that, that I think is, is, tends to be what, what becomes the focus of the discussion, but I'm, I'm, I'm really happy you raised that. I, I, think that, I think hemp's the sleeper issue in this conversation. People become so distracted by the so-called kind of rec market and the industry and the ancillary activities and the imp but the, the, the hemp conversation is a fascinating one. One thing we did change in Canada, so mostly the hemp industry that's existed for the past 10 years has been preserved. Um, um, and, and, and the regulation and the, the regulatory burden that's placed on the hemp industry is you know, a fraction of, of what we've done for the, for the, for the non, for, you know, for, for rec, rec use or medical use. But one thing we did do is we did enable um, hemp farmers who want to uh, sell flour, flour and other kind of CBD rich parts of the plant into the rec or the non-medical system. That, that transaction used to be prohibited and now it's actually enabled. So we've done a few things to actually try to facilitate and encourage the, the development of that industry. And that was the principal grievance. That was the main criticism that we had heard from the hemp industry for about a decade. And so the new regulations that were published a couple of weeks ago uh, actually respond to that and, and give them the ability to do it. And we in the state of Colorado have had a prohibition of hemp products being able to be sold through our licensed dispensaries in the marijuana side. However, um, the industry just went through a sunset process, which is the, the Department of Regulatory Affairs here in the state of Colorado looks at the regulations and then makes proposals on how they should be adjusted. And one of the proposals for um, the difference between the marijuana, or excuse me, med medical marijuana and recreational marijuana is that we should allow for CBD and hemp based products products to be sold into the, the regulated marijuana space. So um, that hasn't happened yet, but it will be a part of our discussion going forward as well. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is JB Canifax, and I'm a prosecutor with the Denver City Attorney's Office. So um, I see that both of you come from a health background, so my question concerns pesticides and herbicides. I know that actually ingesting carcinogenic pesticides can be bad when it's on things like food products, but I know also actually burning and inhaling marijuana that has pesticides on it can be even worse. So my question is, do you, either of you have a plan in place to make sure that the marijuana is safe for consumption in your respective countries, or will there be a way to notify consumers of what pesticides has been sprayed on their products? Yeah, the pesticide problem, that's, that's one thing I wanted to learn from Denver. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, um, I, I think we, we would go, if it's possible, for the no use of, of pesticides at all at the growers in the experiment. Because we do not know, the pesticides are tested on, on tomatoes and apples, but they're not tested for smoking. So we don't know if they're safe to, to, to put on cannabis. Um, but I heard yesterday that you only use some green pesticides and it seems that you have a lot of cannabis. So I think we will go for as, as less pesticides as possible and the growers will have to test their cannabis like uh, you do here. 
So we, we've lived this uh, more or less alongside you guys. And I think Oregon was the one who really um, kind of lived through it hard uh, initially. So we have at the federal level um, a fairly comprehensive policy with respect to the pesticide use uh, in cannabis. Um, uh, so that, that's, that's available, like it's a very technical document if anyone wants to kind of get into it, that's the best place to go. We also have a federal agency that is responsible for governing the use of pesticides across all kind of commodities and, and, and those rules apply equally to cannabis. Um, um, sorry, I lost, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, we, uh, the, basically we have, uh, through that pest, regulatory agency, we've got a list of 22 approved, federally approved pesticides. Um, those are the only ones that are allowed to be uh, used in any way, shape, or form. Um, we have exceedingly strict tolerance limits with respect to um, monitoring the use of any uh, pesticides that are not um, on that list. Uh, we have experience in doing national level recalls when uh, we have found evidence that unapproved pesticides were used. Um, th this is an area that I think has frustrated a, a lot of regulators. I think the science is, is incomplete, especially as you suggested when you, the, the rules and the, and, and the research that has been done is really focused on ingesting and the effects of ingesting can, uh, pesticides on food products. There's been precious little research that's been done and when you ignite the cannabis, dried cannabis and what, what that does uh, to the chemistry of the, pe the pesticide. So I think we're also sort of looking to see the development of research uh, and frankly the development of new products with those, th those, those uses in mind. But anyways, it's an issue that we've been wrestling with and dealing with for many, many years. We've got a, we've, I think we've got a fairly good, but it's a very, a very, very strict policy in place at the federal level. And I know we've got time for two more questions. Let's start over here and then we'll finish over here. Hi, I'm Diane Carlson, and I've been involved in the policy looking out for kids. And I'm just curious how candidate plans to educate and regulate around THC potency. I know that's been a big, big issue for us here, and I was just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so at the risk of Mike kicking me off the panel, <laughs> perhaps we should talk a little bit uh, at the break. So, but. But so there's, there's, a, there's a whole pile of things, right? So there's, there's big education. We've got a $100 million uh, federal education program uh, that has a bunch of different target audiences. Parents and kids are kind of chief amongst them. We have a whole series of regulatory controls with respect to the information on the package, the nature of the package. Um, I, I didn't mention it explicitly, but I should, I should have probably uh, clarified that two weeks ago, we only made legal dried flour and very low potency cannabis oil. Reg federal regulations for other products, so edibles and concentrates, which are the ones that present, I think, the most, the greatest risk with respect to overconsumption by any, you know, at any age group or accidental con consumption, um, particularly by young people. So there, we're about to kind of launch a public consul, national public consultation on those regulations, and you can bet that your question and the kind of getting to the heart of the risk associated with those products um, and, and a, a series of kind of regulatory controls that will be tailored specifically to getting at the, the problem you're flagging. But it's a, that's another, it's a huge, huge conversation I'd be happy to talk more about, but I won't right now. That's great. We can learn a lot from you, so we appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, sir. Well, I have a highly, highly technical question for Eric. Um, can you elaborate on the transition from the use of the word marijuana with an H to cannabis? No. <laughs> All right, I've got one last final question. <laughs> when you look forward with the experiments that you guys are undergoing right now, what is the one thing that keeps you up at night? What's the one thing you're most focused on making sure you get right? forgetting something. I mean, there are so many things you have to think about when you're trying to close the supply chain, you know, the packaging, the grower, what, where does he have to grow, uh, in what municipalities, uh, in what building, uh, do they need safety measures, do I have to 
tell them that they need the safety measures or do they, will they do it at their own? Do we need special things for kids? Do we need, so there's so many things we have to think about now that, that what keeps you up at night is that we forget some. Yeah. Yeah, kind of in a similar vein, like at a certain point, there's just too many things, right? Like the, the, this is, it's, it's funny, right? It's a, I don't know that there's any topic out there that makes people giggle as much as this one. And yet, as soon as you start to really think about it and you start to scratch the surface, you just realize how far reaching and complex it is. So, especially, I mean, from a, from a national perspective, you didn't, you didn't ask any questions and nor did anyone else, but the kind of the global implications of, of what, it, what it is we're doing. Certainly the relationship that Canada enjoys with the US is kind of, uh, is also tremendously important. So there's a whole series of very, very difficult issues with respect to the Canada-US border, their trade implications. Um, um, and, and all manner of complexities to how this thing's going to roll out. But I think what I've observed, um, and why none of that does keep me up at night, is at a certain point, you know, two or three years ago, you know, you'd go to the office, and there's only a couple of people working with you, and you'd pick up the phone to try to talk to somebody, you know, ask, you know the, asking the Federal Department of Agriculture how they were thinking about their, their crop subsidy programs and how they were going to adjust their policies and whether they were or not or talking to the Department of National Defense and wondering how the, the change of law would apply on Canadian forces bases overseas, and a million other questions. And they'd just look at you and they'd be like, oh, you know, go away. And then at a certain point, you, um, you know, like you're not alone. And there are literally thousands and thousands of other people who are deeply invested in making this a success. And so I never had, I don't have any problem sleeping at night because there are a lot of people rowing this ship all in the same direction. Um, and yeah, the problems are really tough and the solutions are not always immediately apparent, but you're, you know, you're no longer alone. And again, it kind of takes us full circle. And it's, it's been, uh, that sense of not feeling alone has been even greater when we were able to pick up the phone and call you know, Rick in Washington or Steve in Oregon, or like, and, 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 and you guys here, of course, and, it's, and that's been terrific. Well, I, I appreciate that, and it's actually a good way to wrap up and end and, and say thank you. You know, when I first started in this role about 16 months ago, very shortly thereafter, I had the opportunity to come up to Canada and to speak with your parliament about our experience and um, had the pleasure of sitting down and having coffee with you for an hour, and it's actually, we had a fabulous conversation, but what I really took away from that conversation was, oh wait, I'm not alone. There are other people that are out there doing this. There are other people that we can reach out and, and have conversations with and collaborate with, and for those of you who are in the room or are thinking about going down this path that haven't yet gone down this path, know that um, the regulated marketplace is one where we collaborate constantly, both with our other states, with the municipalities that are going through it as well as with our federal partners as well. Um, we regularly bring together all of the states that are looking at legalization or have legalized to have policy level discussions around how are you handling these issues like pesticide, these issues like black market activity. And it's that debate and that dialogue that really allows for us to improve on an ever going basis our regulations and hearing from gentlemen like these who are doing it at the federal level as well is extremely beneficial too. And just wanna say thanks to both of you for traveling such a long way to join us here today and uh, for sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.